Okay, here's the buzz. Here's the deal. Here's what's happening. Financial Management, uh, 11th edition, uh, subtitled Principles and Applications, is a great book, but it throws a lot of stuff at you in the first three chapters. So hopefully, this about 11 minute video will make it easier for you to digest those uh, first three chapters. First of all, we decide that finance is a study of how people and businesses evaluate investments and raise money for them. So I decided to buy a new car. First of all, I have to decide which car I'm going to buy. Then I have to decide whether I'm going to buy it or lease it. And if I do buy it, do I borrow the money for it or do I pay cash? That, those are all examples of the kinds of decisions we're going to talk about, but mostly from the point of view of businesses. Speaking of businesses, the first chapter goes on to talk about different ways that businesses can be formed. Uh, sole proprietorship is easy to start, but dangerous due to unlimited personal liability. For example, I decide to sell lemonade on the street corner. I just start selling lemonade. don't have to file any corporate documents. I don't have to form any partnership agreements. All I do is start selling lemonade. However, if somebody gets sick, they're going to sue me and all my personal assets are at risk. Another way to do business is as a partnership. So uh, my friend Charles and I form a general partnership. We both go out and we both sell lemonade. Easy to start, but again, the same danger is that if somebody gets sick, they can sue us, and in the lawsuit, we might lose all our uh, personal belongings and all our wealth. A limited partnership would have one or more general partners and one or more limited partners. So suppose Charles just gives me some money, I go out and I'm the face of the lemonade business, a poor marketing decision by the way, and I'm out there trying to sell lemonade and Charles is behind the scenes. He could be a limited partner and all he could lose is his original investment. He wouldn't necessarily be personally liable for any damages should somebody get sick. Another way to do business is to form a corporation. It's a separate legal entity. It can sue and be sued. And what we might do is we might form the Lemonade Corporation. So only the money that we've invested in that corporation would be at risk. And we wouldn't have the unlimited personal liability. Also, your book uh, mentions that, kind of out of context, that the way that shareholders get money then is through dividends. So a corporation has a few extra dollars laying around. They issue dividends to their shareholders. A more modern, very common way of doing business is the LLC, the Limited Liability Company. It's easy to create. You file some articles with the Secretary of State. You draft an operating agreement. And this allows you to have limited liability, but you don't have to have shareholders meetings and send out proxy statements and all the other things that you have to do with a corporation. It's just a little more user friendly. And it also provides limited liability to its members. So Charles and I might form an LLC. We each put $1,000 in, and that's all that we could lose in the event we got sued. The next part of chapter one talks about four basic principles of finance, and I'm going to say that there's really five. The first principle is that money has time value. So uh, my lazy ex-brother-in-law owes me $100. He says, would you rather have that $100 today or a year from now? I say I would rather have it today because let's assume I can earn 2% on my money. If he gives me that $100 today, I can invest it and a year from now I'll have $102. If on the other hand I wait until a year from now for him to give me the $100, I only have $100 a year from now. So in terms of finance jargon, we say that $100 is the present value of $102 to be received one year from now, assuming a 2% discount rate. In other words, if he comes to me and says, Russ, would you rather have $100 today or $102 a year from now, I am indifferent because those are the same sums of money. We're gonna spend a tremendous amount of energy and time learning how to do present value and future value calculations on our calculators in this class. The second basic principle is that there's a risk-return trade-off. The greater the risk of an investment, the greater the potential return. So if somebody comes to you and says, 
I have two investments. One has a zero risk and you can earn 25%. The other one's a little bit riskier, but uh, you can earn 10% on that. Something's wrong with that statement. The greater the risk, the greater the potential return. The third basic principle is that cash is king. In accounting class, we spend a lot of energy figuring out what the net income is. In finance class, we care about when we get the cash in because when we get that cash, that's when we can reinvest it in our business and start earning money on it. The fourth principle is that market prices reflect information. So if our stock is trading at $40 a share and we issue a press release with some bad news, what should happen to our stock price is it should go down. And the fifth principle which I'm adding is that taxes impact business decisions. I live on the border of California and Oregon. I go to buy that car I talked about earlier. I'm going to buy it in Oregon because there's no sales tax in Oregon. So whenever we make a business decision, we want to take into account income taxes when we're trying to decide which course of action we're going to take. The big picture message in chapter two of our book is that there are savers in the world, people with extra money, and there are borrowers in the world, people that need more money to do things. And the way those two interact with each other is through intermediaries. So let's say I want to borrow $20,000 for a new car. I am a borrower in this instance. I don't go directly to my neighbor who is a saver. He has put $20,000 into his local bank. I go down to that bank and I borrow the money from them. So the bank charges me say 5% interest, pays this guy 1% interest, and has 4% profit, if you will, on the transaction. And your book outlines a bunch of intermediaries, things like banks, financial services corporations like GE Capital, insurance companies like John, John Hancock, investment banks like Goldman Sachs, investment companies, mutual funds and exchange traded funds, hedge funds, private equity funds. Those are all entities where savers invest their money with these folks, and then those folks invest it on their behalf. And some of the specific financial instruments for moving money from savers to borrowers are debt securities. Those have a due date and an interest rate. Equity securities, where a company might sell common stock or preferred stock. Remember, preferred stock has a preference as to dividends as an, and as to liquidation. And common stock is just where a person owns a part of the company with no promise of a dividend. And they are looking to make money either through potential dividends in the future or through appreciation in value of the common stock. Okay, chapter three is just a review of your accounting class. Remember the four basic financial statements, the income statement, the statement of retained earnings, the balance sheet, and the statement of cash flows. The income statement covers a period of time. It's our revenue minus our expenses to give us net income. Two things that are really important. We subtract depreciation expense. We subtract depreciation expense to get our operating income, which in finance class we'll call EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. But depreciation expense is a non-cash expense. And remember, we care about cash flows in finance class. So please don't forget, depreciation expense is a non-cash expense. And also, please remember that we subtract interest expense before we calculate our taxes. So interest expense results in a lower taxes. So we're going to have to look at our interest expense before taxes and after taxes. And remember from accounting class, what connects the income statement and the balance sheet is the statement of retained earnings. Retained earnings at the beginning of the year, plus net income, that's this net income here, minus dividends, gives us retained earnings at the end of the year. So remember, dividends are things that we pay out to our shareholders, and they reduce our retained earnings. It's almost always cash, but it could be property. 
The third financial statement is our balance sheet. Remember, assets on the left-hand side, things that we own, versus what we owe on the right-hand side, those are called liabilities. And the difference between what we own and what we owe is our equity. And it may be broken down into preferred stock, the par value of the common stock, additional paid in capital. Remember, that's any dollars we got above the par value of the common stock when we sold it. And retained earnings. Remember, retained earnings at the beginning of the year plus net income minus dividends gives us retained earnings at the end of the year. Earnings that we've retained in the business and have not paid back to our shareholders. Remember, a balance sheet always balances what we own, balances with what we owe and our equity in the business. And the fourth financial statement is the statement of cash flows. We want to tell the world what happened to our cash during the year. We focus on operating cash flows, investing cash flows, and financing cash flows. You take the total changes of those of operating, investing, and financing, and that gives you your total change in cash. Add that to the cash at the beginning of the year, and you end up with the cash at the end of the year. And there's two final topics in Chapter 3. Tax rates. So take a look at page 45. You'll see that it's a progressive tax system we're uh, allegedly uh, working with. The more money we make, the uh, higher our tax rate, allegedly. Um, so take a look at the, the uh, table that's on page 45 of your book. Also, there's a thing called the dividend exclusion. So Congress wants to encourage companies to invest in other companies. So if they own a certain percentage of that company, they get to exclude some of those dividends that they receive from their taxable income. For example, if General Motors owns 30% of an auto parts company and receives a dividend of $100, GM only pays taxes on 25% of that $100 or $25. All right, so that's a summary of chapters one, two, and three of your book. I uh, hope this helps uh, you digest all the material that's in there. Come to class with your book and your calculator and your best shot at doing the homework, and we're going to have fun.